Tracy, let me ask you: Are, are we are we at a time where, in the squamous population, PDL1 testing should be standard of care in all patients? Absolutely, and that is a new position for me. That just came along with was the it hard presentation. For you? It wasn't that difficult. <laughs> I somehow managed to get over. But it was, it's been, it's been. I say that facetiously, but it's been very difficult for our institution actually because it meant buying, getting, purchasing the platform by which right. we do the test um, in the way it was done in the Keynote 24 study. So we had to do that as a send out, and only just recently we were able to get the machinery that we needed to do the test in house. So yes, it was not difficult for me, but for my colleagues, it was actually quite difficult. And inexpensive, probably. And expensive, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when initially the first checkpoint inhibitor that got approved in lung cancer, that was nivolumab in squamous, and in that initial randomized study versus docetaxel, PDL1 level didn't matter. And we've had a lot of debate about whether there was any any worth in testing PDL1, because even in the studies that came later, the non squamous studies and then the atezolizumab and the pembrolizumab uh, second line studies, where the level did seem to predict for an enhanced population, even in the zero percent patients, they still did as well with better toxicity than docetaxel. So I was not a big tester until Keynote 24 came around, and clearly in the high expressing patients who had greater than 50 percent expression, they've got a better option out there than chemotherapy, and it's independent of histology. Right. It's true in the squames, it's true in the non-squames. Right. So everybody needs to be tested for PDL1, and we now have that as reflex testing at our institution, which is also wonderful because I had to order it separately before. Okay, so that's the first step. We all agree that patients should be tested. The next issue is how should they be tested? You know, we've, 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 I, I like to refer to the last 18 months as the immuno tsunami. You know, we've had a, you know, change the standard of care in second line, now first line. Um, each of the immunotherapeutic agents um, have been developed with a companion or complementary antibody. Um, it's not feasible to have four different or more different platforms for testing these. Jared, what's, what's your perspective on what's being done to kind of get us to um, kind of a one test platform, if you will? Right, so if you look historically, right, you look to say, for example, the development of HER2 in breast cancer. There originally were multiple tests to look at this, and that, of course, wasn't going to fly in the long run. Um, the, our current situation, as you pointed out, is we have four different antibodies uh, developed by two different companies with four different sets of staining conditions and lots of different ways of reading them. Not surprisingly, um, you get heterogeneity and how it helps you. Um, some of these are even described differently in different studies of the same drug. Um, so there have been two major attempts to uh, reconcile this, uh, the Blueprint Project and the French Harmonization Project. So Blueprint looked at four of uh, these antibodies, uh, 22C3, 288, SP, uh, 263 and SP142. Uh, what they found is that um, all of these really stained mostly similarly on tumor cells, with the exception of SP142, that stained fewer tumor cells um, and fewer uh, immune cells. Uh, overall, the discordance rate in some fashion between the uh, assays was about a third, although that fell dramatically if you uh, left out uh, SP142. And interestingly, they made attempts to um, say, OK, well, is it just that we're looking at these differently, right? What if we look at one antibody, uh, score them all the same way, right? Uh, take the rules from one test and look at the other test. Can the concordance go up? Are we really biologically looking at the same thing? And it turns out it gets worse. If you try to look at uh, any of these tests in a way that's different from the way they were developed, that, that attempt uh, failed. So what do you do with this in practice? Um, you look at the FDA label for the drug that you're considering using, and you get the test associated with it, and you get it, and you score it as you're supposed to. So, for example, we were talking about first-line pembrolizumab. If that's what you're considering, you need to get 22C3, and you need to look for at least 50% staining um, in tumor cells, regardless of intensity and what's going on in immune cells. There was another attempt um, to bring this all together to harmonize this, the French study. That looked at three of these antibodies, uh, 288, 22C3, uh, and SP263. Uh, at a 50% uh, level, they were 95% uh, uh, concordant. But then they took it a step further, and they said, look, in the real world, people are often using laboratory um, derived tests. So they looked at 27 real lab derived tests that people were looking to use, and it was just about half that were discordant. Um, again, saying you, again, reinforcing the point, you really need to go to the standardized test um, for whatever drug you're looking to use and use it as indicated. 
I would say for those of us in the research uh, world, um, at some point we probably want to stop torturing PDL1 until it confesses something and consider better biomarkers. Well, I don't disagree with that. However, I also think that when you look across all the studies and all the antibodies we have, PDL1 status has been informative. As difficult as the IHC is to do and, and get a standardized test, it does tell us something to an about extent, these sorts. Of, yeah, right? I don't know. Do you, yeah, Pos I'm, positive yeah. predictive value. You yeah. can you can push it to give you some positive predictive right. value. But as Tracy explained uh, very well a few minutes ago, negative predictive value, particularly in later lines, has been a little more problematic. Right. And so, um, are at each of our institutions, is it the PDL1 testing done in house? We have not taken the leap. Um, to purchasing that. the machine, 22C3 remains a send out. It, you, it's in house. In house. In house recently. We were in house in October, so that's when we yeah. implemented it. Yeah. So we we just started uh, using the SB263 antibody um, uh, in, internally. So so that's what we do, and and we've convinced our pathologist to do it reflexively on at the time of diagnosis. So I think that that helps, and that's mm -hmm. I think that's where we have to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I think. Um, Ed and I had the pleasure of learning a lot about PDL1 testing a week or so ago, and I thought that was quite informative. I came away with that, that saying that the the, the three antibodies in get SB142 out of there, they have very similar performance characteristics, and, and I think that you know um, that's what it is. But I know at the community level, most people are sending them out. You know, community oncologists have to send them someplace. And I know on one of the lab slips that we have, I don't remember which third party company it was, but it actually said, um, you know, are you planning to use the Merck drug or the BMS drug? And they, they would use a different test based on that sort of thing. So I, I know that, that's, um, that, that that's there.